So um, it is my great pleasure to welcome here today uh, Sandra Singlo. She's coming to us direct from Pasadena, California. Hello, Sandra. Hello. Sorry about that. Living room. room. <laughs> we never know it was your living room. This is just a total. <laughs> we thought it was a TV studio. Okay. Um, Sandra has long been one of my uh, favorite writers. She's a humor writer uh, for publications, including The Atlantic, which she has written hilarious, um, but also deep articles for for many years. She's the article of, uh, she's the author of a wonderful book um, that I read even before I knew her, uh, The Mad Woman and the, uh, and, and the Volvo, the Volvo. <laughs> and her new one, which is coming out, which I cannot wait to read is The Mad Woman and the Roomba, My Year of Domestic Mayhem, which I think now, given that we're all in confinement domestically, we can really relate to. And you but can see I, what it looks like. <laughs> it looks very clean, actually. But what I didn't know about Sandra is that she has a BS in, in physics from Caltech, and that she has this whole other part of her life in which she does a weekly radio show for NPR stations around the world. She reaches millions of people every week. And it's uh, called The Lowdown on Science. And can you tell us a little bit about this, Sandra, how you got started and what it's about? Yeah, I, I got my BS in physics in 1983, which is like the Stone Age. Um, and I like to say I put the BS into physics because at Caltech, um, it's like I was really quite confused uh, much of the time. So I both know what science is about generally, but I also know what it is to, when, when people try to explain it, and it's very confusing. My father was from Shanghai, and he was that kind of excitable Chinese engineer who just yelled concepts at you that you didn't understand, very jargony, um, full of math that you, you know. And so this, the lowdown in science was started in 2004. It was actually the brainchild of Caltech at that time and SEPR of having minutes of science a day that were relatable and that the general public could understand and that were kind of like funny and witty and engaging as possible while people in LA particularly are driving in their cars. So because science is such an important story, obviously that should be told today. Um, and we need more science, science communicators that can get the story across because the general public is actually very interested in science but are put off by the jargon. So we started- Science yeah. communication. Actually, yeah. you teach scientists yeah. how to tell their stories. I exactly, and, and I think you'll see some of my brilliant protégés here today, and they'll be impressed with them because they are scientists and they are also great communicators. So we started this Lowdown on Science Pandemic Edition just because listeners were interested in kind of what's the science of pandemics. And so I was excited because we are still doing a regular slate of programs to have my scientists, what we call the hive, you can put down the first slide of the lowdown on science hive, right. and they're all you using, the queen, I, of course. Yeah, I am the queen bee of the hive, I throw donuts and pizza into the cage, and then they make the brilliant work. Um, so, um, and that they're all UC Irvine graduate students in science, or some of them have moved beyond, we're going to meet a couple of them, who have moved beyond, um, who have, uh, um, graduated. So they, and they're really incredible. They're, they're great communicators. And we thought it would be wonderful to have, first of all, young scientists communicating science because they're so diverse. The role models are terrific for kids. It's not all Bill Nye, the science guy in the bow tie, as you'll see. And I see there's some kids here today. Hello, children. Be, you know, and, um, and, and they're very relatable, and we really are hoping that these family-friendly modules will inspire the next generation of kids at home, the virologists, computer scientists, urban transportation engineers, et cetera, to be scientists of the next generation. And you've been inspired. I mean, obviously, the pandemic is a, is a, is a very diff trying and difficult event, but it's also, if you're interested in science, a real learning opportunity, too. So that's what we're trying to do today is is see what lessons we can learn from it. Right, exactly. So I think with that, we'll for, turn to our first um, reporter, LDOS pandemic reporter. Uh, he is a brain and robot expert at Caltech, my alma mater. And this is, please give a virtual welcome to Dr. Sumner Norman. Hello, Hello everyone. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so tell us about what you do when you're, you're a brain and robot expert at Caltech. What do you do, Summer? Yeah, so my technical title is I'm a postdoctoral researcher. Um, I'm in biological engineering at Caltech, and I design what are called brain machine interfaces. So these devices help people who have suffered a brain or spinal cord injury uh, that paralyzes part of their body. 
So in short, we surgically implant devices into the brain that record brain activity, and with enough practice, people can learn to control those devices. Then we can hook it up to anything we want. I prefer robotic prosthetics because robots are amazing. Uh, but put simply, my research teaches people to control robotic arms and hands with nothing but their thoughts so they can move again. That's one of the coolest things that are possible in this particular world. And I think what's interesting about what you do is, you know, you take, you know, a, a difficult situation and then use, instead of meeting it with sadness and defeat, you, you treat it with innovation, you, which is kind of a little bit of what you've been writing about for the pandemic edition, this notion of silver linings in times of global world crises. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's exactly right. Um, so I've been accused of being an optimist once or twice before. <laughs> but um, I'm sure you all remember those feelings of anxiety and uncertainty in those first days of the pandemic, especially when it was so unclear what was going to happen. Um, a lot of businesses were closing and people were, were well, to purchasing toilet paper mostly. <laughs> but what I remember most wasn't actually the worry. It was more of a sense of needing to do something useful, to a call to action, if you will. And I wasn't alone, I really quickly found. Um, it was actually a very human reaction in a way. An animal in distress might fight or flee, but humans, we tend to really think our way out of situations. So we're really quite good at this. It's just that our generations hadn't really experienced anything like the pandemic before. Um, but the workforce of the 1910s and 20s had, so I started looking to history for an answer. Um, so I'm sure you've all heard of the Roaring Twenties, the 1920s. There was this real explosion of innovation and prosperity, um, and I'm seeing slides pop up right on time. So if we can go to the next one, I've included a, a photo of the Ford Model T, and this was the world's first mass-produced automobile. And in, the in 1927, Ford, I believe, rolled out their 15 millionth Model T, out of the factory, which is just crazy to think of the scale and change that that must have felt like when uh, any family could start driving an automobile. Uh, radios became really common too. So for the first time, we were regularly transmitting shows into people's homes, into their living rooms. And I thought this would be cool to include this photo because it might be the original example of being together while being separate, just like now. Um, so everything seemed to be possible through technology and science. Uh, innovation wasn't really born out of easy times, actually. In fact, in 1918, the deadly Spanish flu had infected nearly a quarter of humanity. And if we remember what was happening right before that, it, those numbers may be even worse because the world was just cleaning up from World War I. So after these periods of calamity, I found that there were these periods of prosperity that tended to follow. And with coronavirus, we've already seen some of that happening. So science is moving faster than I have ever seen it move before. Um, the first vaccine was in clinical trials just 63 days after the outbreak. That's just insane to think. It's an order of magnitude faster than what would normally happen. And the international collaborations are entirely new. And this show is just another example. I probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to be here with you on Zoom today uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic. So I, for one, am really excited to see what types of innovations we're all going to come up with and which ones will stick over the next decade. Right, and I think the innovations aren't just on a public level, they're also on a personal level as well for those, particularly those students stuck at home. And you unearthed another story that I, I just found really interesting. Yes, I did. So um, that's exactly right. I actually heard this story, and if we can go to the next slide, we'll see. Uh, I actually heard the story in my first year physics class and it really stuck with me for some reason. So when the pandemic happened, it really came to the uh, top really quickly. We've probably all heard the beginning. So a student sees an apple fall from a tree and sort of wonders, why does everything fall straight and perpendicular to the ground? Of course, that student ended up being Isaac Newton. The falling apple was his inspiration and it drove him to the discovery of gravity. And the discovery of gravity doesn't really just uh, work for apples. Newton showed that it works uh, for moons, planets, and stars, and how they orbit one another. So we're talking about a discovery that was one of the most beautiful and impactful on the scale of the universe to ever be made in science. But the part of the story you may not have heard is that that apple actually fell during a pandemic. So in 1665, uh, the bubonic plague was really tearing through England. Um, and on the 7th of August, Cambridge University closed and they sent their students home, so just like now. A 24-year-old Isaac Newton actually returned to his childhood home, and this is it on the left here. It's still standing if you want to visit it. It's in Woolsthorpe, England. Um, 
but I would wait until maybe the pandemic is over before visiting, <laughs> probably closed. Um, but as if, as if discovering gravity weren't enough, Newton actually drilled a hole in one of those windows in the shutter to let sunlight in. And I'm showing a, a picture or a rendition of that here. And using a series of glass prisms, he was actually projecting the rainbow onto the wall. And this allowed him to show that white light is in fact made up of the combination of all colors, which we probably have all heard in school, but it was actually Isaac that discovered this as a 24 year old stuck at home because he couldn't finish his studies. So of course, the Great Plague came to an end and he uh, became a professor and went on to a quite storied career, but it was really those discoveries in quarantine that actually built the foundation of this incredible science. Yeah, so that's right, kids. Get off of Animal Crossing and start inventing new laws of physics. No pressure, though. <laughs> and don't forget to patent them for your parents. <laughs> okay, next up we have Brenna Biggs, who is a UC Irvine chemist. Um, and so tell us a little bit about what you do, Brenna. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, um, I am an atmospheric chemist at UC Irvine. I collect air samples all around the world on NASA airplanes, inside mobile labs, or on foot. And I analyze these samples to figure out the air quality worldwide. Um, particularly, I'm interested in looking at air quality and the stinky air that gets emitted from landfills and dairy farms in California. <laughs> A glamorous but very important, important job. And so you started, started studying the history of vaccines and it turned out to be interesting, but at least one very surprising character. Jealous. Yeah, I found out about this amazing woman who's on this slide here. Her name is Lady Mary Wortley Montague, which is quite a mouthful. And she was the wealthy daughter of an English 17th century duke. And she was also quite a fiery feminist for her day. She rebelled against everything. She rebelled against her father, society, everything. She rejected the suitor that her father chose for her and she ended up eloping with a politician. She even rejected smallpox. Uh, she rebelled against that too. She caught the disease and the disease did mar her skin, but she survived. Her husband later became the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, which we now call Turkey. And they ended up moving to Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul. And while she was there, she witnessed a method of inoculation known as variolation. And this is a particular type of inoculation that's called variolation because it comes from the Latin word for smallpox, which is variola. And in this method, it's a little gross, they would take pus from infected smallpox victims, they would purchase the pus and then rub that onto scratches of healthy people to try to get the pus into their bloodstream. So this, although it's gross, made them later immune from catching full-blown smallpox. So they became inoculated against smallpox. And this very much intrigued Lady Montague, so much so that she had her own son variolated in the Ottoman Empire against smallpox. And he was the youngest Western European to be inoculated, only four years old. So she was very eager to take this practice back to her homeland of England, but she faced very strong opposition, possibly from sexism or perceived medical know-how or religious differences. Um, eventually, though, she did convince the Princess of Wales to start doing Western Europe's first attempt at clinical trials, which was basically just rubbing pus on orphans and prisoners to see if that would work. <laughs> and with great success, this new method became very popular, and it even led to the smallpox vaccine, which was created by Edward Jenner a few decades later. So now we have vaccines for many different things, and hopefully eventually for coronavirus, and we can thank Lady Montague and her discovery for bravely bringing the idea back to Western Europe. So the ideas being tested out for a vaccine for coronavirus are based on the same principle that you take the disease and essentially inject it into people? Similar idea. I'm not sure about the, um, the specifics of the vaccines that are being developed right now, but in general, you want to take some form of that disease. For example, when Edward Jenner made the, the smallpox vaccine, he actually used cowpox to do that, which is a slightly less aggressive version of smallpox but it's similar enough that they were inoculating people against smallpox still. So something like that could possibly work as well. Yeah, and I, I love that in 15th century China, apparently they snorted scabs. That's correct, nose. yes. They would grind <laughs> them up into a powder and have someone shoot the scabs <laughs> into their nose. With the a Chinese, uh, my people. Um, <laughs> I mean, and, and have you really studied how, how people have responded to pandemics through time? And uh, you also, 
uh, pulled up some very interesting stuff about masks, use of masks. That's correct. So if we want to go to the next slide, um, this really focuses on between the 16th and 18th centuries, there was a lot of different bubonic plague outbreaks. And the first responders for bubonic plague wore handkerchiefs to try to protect themselves against miasma, which is an imaginary toxic air that they thought was causing disease. And you can see that in the image on the right, everybody that's responding to the plague has some sort of handkerchief around their face trying to block out this air they thought was causing the problem. The plague doctors during this time, which have the very iconic beak masks, those masks are actually packed with sweet smelling flowers and herbs and spices to try to block this imaginary air. Um, if we wanna to go to the next slide here, although our ancestors wore the humble hanky to try to keep the air out, we eventually discovered that germs were actually the problem, not this imaginary miasma that everybody thought was causing the problem. So when we finally learned about germs, we designed masks to try to keep cooties to ourselves. This led to the invention of the surgical mask, which you can see on the upper right part of the slide. And these are still worn around hospitals to get today, and these try to keep our germs in. Then there was another flip-flop as time went on, and newer masks were created to try to keep germs out, like the N95 respirator mask that you see on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. And you might have seen a lot of these in the news recently. These block 95% of non-oily particles, meaning N95. So these masks are literally supercharged to block gunk from getting into our systems. They have three layers that adhere tightly to your face to prevent germs from sneaking in through the side. However, as for whether or not regular people need to wear one, experts recommend leaving them for the professionals, like medical staff, construction workers, etc. So masks have come a long way throughout history, and I'm sure over time they will continue to improve. So Brenda, um, if we're wearing one of the surgical masks, we're not protected at all from other people's germs? All we're doing is blocking them from getting ours? Wearing a surgical mask is more of a selfless act in which in case you are sick, you are protecting other people from your own droplets that could be coming out of your nose and mouth. So we have been told to wear handkerchiefs or surgical masks and not N95 masks to try to prevent ourselves from spreading the disease to other people. Um, on the flip side though, the N95 masks would be worn by more, someone in more of a medical capacity to try to prevent other people from getting them sick. I myself want to go back to wearing a beak mask and throwing back because I think that would be very fashionable <laughs> and fill it with flowers. Next up, we'll pivot to uh, Dr. Ted Yu, who is a materials scientist. What does that mean? I, I should just say really quickly to the viewers, if you have questions, please ask them in chat and we'll get to them after the presentation. Ted. Right. Uh, so material science, yeah, I have my PhD in material science from UC Irvine. That means I study uh, the properties of materials so that we can better make new ones, understand the ones we have right now, uh, see if we can use them better or make them better somehow. Uh, nowadays, I work at a uh, medical device company. I try to make a, um, a continuous glucose sensor that's next generation. You just slap it on. If, you have, if you're a diabetes patient, you can just monitor your blood glucose levels constantly. It'll be more accurate and way cheaper than what we have on the market. And that's kind of working on now. You seem like really confident and specific about what you're doing, yet you're fascinated with uncertainty or certain uncertainty or certain uh, un whatever you can tell us what, what do you mean by that yeah so as a scientist i think about uncertainty a lot uh because it has a very specific meaning in science um uh, but also i also think about uncertainty because you know it's in the middle of a pandemic and i'm wondering when i can start going outside again uh because um scientists have a bit of a complex about this uh, so we don't like not having an answer for things, number one. And number two, when we say uncertainty and um, errors and stuff like that, that means something very specific in science. Uh, uncertainty means if you take a look at the picture on the right side here. So let's say, for example, I'll give an example. Let's say you have a yogurt factory and you have a machine that fills yogurt containers up to 250 grams. Now, because nothing's perfect, nothing can be perfect, you're going to have like a little overage or underage of 2.5 grams. That 2.5 grams is called your uncertainty. It's going to be around 250, hovering around that by as much as 2.5 grams. 
That's what we mean by uncertainty. Um, but when the public hears uncertainty, the sci scientists like me have a fear that, well, uncertainty sounds like we don't know what we're doing. Error sounds like someone made a mistake. And then so you're introducing a lot of this additional uncertainty, uh, the second kind. And scientists wonder, hey, is that helpful for people to understand what's going on? Because when you go to the supermarket to buy yogurt, you don't care if it's filled to like a really precise 0.5 grams or it's filled to three grams or whatever. You just want blueberries because blueberries are delicious. And but with the pandemic, it's, it's different. You want to be certain, but um, I, I think you, and you right. uncovered a really interesting study about what happens when you cite uncertainty. Yeah, so um, kind of the study that I uh, wrote about, they looked at talking about uncertainty to people. So because in science, we say, if you don't talk about the uncertainty, it's not a real measurement because you don't know what the accuracy is going to be. And that's an important part of the measurement, to know how accurate you are. And it turns out that if you fully disclose the scientific uncertainty that's involved in a measurement, that doesn't really diminish any trust in science, which is good news because that's part of the full story. And that's also telling us people have a, uh, people have a good understanding of, they're able to handle the truth essentially. Right, and yes, and so that you can be confident, even though media headlines are always you know, the sensational and going for clicks, if you express that uncertainty, you know, people can trust science as, as well. It seems like there's uh, a lot of frustration now because there's so much uncertainty. When, when can we open up again? When is the pandemic right. peaking, the curve? There's so much uncertainty. But Ted, your point is that this is all built into the science of pandemics as well, that it's not, we don't have to blame. I mean, politicians can make all kinds of errors and leaders can make all kinds of errors, but the uncertainty is not their fault. No, that's just because if you don't have enough data to know, then how can you know? Uh, for example, my dentist just today, in fact, sent me an email saying, oh, we're going to push back your appointment by two weeks because you don't, you don't come in and stay home. Uh, but two weeks ago, they said the same thing. They said two weeks ago, oh, we're going to push it back two weeks. Coronavirus is a thing. Please stay home. Uh, uh, they also did that two weeks before that as well. Um, and I suspect they'll do it again. They keep pushing it back because we don't know how many people are infected until we know how many people are infected. We right. just gotta so, measure it. So if somebody says that they don't know, you should trust them <laughs> as opposed to saying, uh, and I'm true. not gonna yes. get political as opposed to saying, I'm a really smart person. I just have a sense about these things and I'm right. And yeah, so it's a good lesson. I think that- oh, embrace uncertain. This is an age of uncertainty that we're in right now. We should just go with it. Yes. Yeah. I think, uh, let, let us pivot now, uh, I, I don't know why I'm using the verb pivot, to Kellen Carta, who is with us. Um, and Kellen is a, uh, also Dr. Carta, I would say, because you graduated from UC Irvine, and you are there, you are working at Bear Paint, and you're fascinated by paint. Which is why going to talk about endemics. I think we, we missed one slide for him. Oh, yes. Can you, okay. Yes, I'm sorry, I jumped forward, Ted. I was gonna suggest you guys go up the slide, but yeah, it's fine. Ted, do you wanna talk about endemics too? Sure, yeah. Um, this was uh, another thing I wrote about. Uh, the, uh, so sitting in this pandemic kind of got me thinking like, okay, what does it really take to get rid of a disease entirely? Um, uh, and what I came up against is the history of a particular endemic. Uh, endemic is different from pandemics in that pandemics hit the globe really quickly. The disease comes out of nowhere and a lot of people get sick. Endemics have always been around and they stick around. Uh, they've, they're so common and so normal that it's just you're, you're sick and it's part of life. It's just how it is. Uh, one of those uh, illnesses that struck Japan uh, back post-World War II were fecal oral route diseases. And yes, it's as gross as it sounds. Uh, that's when poop makes it into your food via the five Fs, uh, flies, fields, fluids, fingers. And finally that gets into your food. Uh, one of the ways you can prevent that from happening is to wash your hands, that, that you get rid of the fingers, which is one of the biggest ways poop gets into your food, especially after going to the bathroom. But there used to be a time when washing your hands after going to the bathroom was a novel idea and it just it wasn't a thing so the japanese ministry they were like well how are we going to get people to wash their hands 
because uh, we're having it's it's a problem. Uh, it's going to get it's getting people sick. Um, this is a new idea. We just learned about germs. People got to wash their hands, get rid of them off their hands. So, the thing about adults is that none of us like being told what to do, <laughs> even if it's a good idea. We just don't like being told what to do. So, one of the things that the government leveraged was kids, actually, education. So in school, they'd learn about germs uh, and you'd learn about washing your hands and how that gets rid of the germs. And then the children would go home and take that lesson and be like, hey, in school, they told us you gotta wash your hands after going to the bathroom, you're not washing your hands. And then they kind of tease their parents about it. And then after a while, it starts to sting enough and then people start changing their behavior. And the lesson there is you really have to think about if something is a particular way. You got to think about the way it is and you got to look at the history of how it got there to be really able to tailor a program specifically to change a behavior for yeah, you know, Ted, I a think good that's idea really to work. smart because I, I remember with um, some recycling issues I didn't really stop trying to eliminate plastic from my house till my son came home from school and said we just learned in school you're not supposed to be using plastic why are you still doing that? So I think this Japanese poster is really smart. Yeah, totally true. Totally true. Um, and thank you for that. So you kids at home, bother your parents. You've learned something here. Make your parents' lives a living nightmare and tell them what to do and save the world. It works. Shall, okay. So Kellen, we can do the now back again to Kellen if we might. And I know you've been eager to tell us why you're fascinated by paint. Yes. Um, well, yes. Hello, everybody. Yes. Welcome. This is a uh office that I'm hunkering down in at Bear. <laughs> um, so I recently graduated from UC Irvine also with a degree in chemistry. Um, and But similar to Ted, I also prefer the more material aspect of things. So when I found out um, you know, that I could use my skills as a chemist in paint, I was pretty excited. And there is so much that goes into paint, which I had no idea. Um, I mean, it's there's there can be up to fifth. Yeah, there's a ton of ingredients. It's insane. And what's fascinating is that each one can affect how the paint acts and what it does. And um, one of the very important ingredients that we must include is that we need to ensure that paint has um, uh, it has a chemical in it to preserve it because you know just kind of like our food, paint can go bad and you don't want it sitting there and then suddenly it uh, is going to get eaten away. Um, Paint also actually relies on uh, surfactants, which I really love. I've always loved surfactants. I used that in my research at UC Irvine. I use it in paint and um, we all use surfactants every day. Oh, we can actually go back a slide. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Um, so surfactants are the chemicals that are in soap that actually protect us against the virus. So I have been focusing a lot of my articles on um, the different chemical measures that we can take to protect ourselves from viruses. In the case of soap, we have surfactants in soap that pretty much, um, so viruses are very oily. And if you're trying to just rinse that off with water, like if you've ever eaten something very greasy, just water won't cut it, right? It doesn't wash off your hands. It doesn't wash off your pans and it's not gonna wash away a greasy virus. That's why we have soap, which has a surfactant that allows us to interact with both water and oil. So water and oil don't mix, but the surfactant kind of bridges that gap. And so it's um, included in soap and that's why our soap is so effective against viruses. So it does work and it is actually best practice, even though it's such a small and mundane task. Um, I've also touched on sanitizers, but the one that I know I'm really supposed to be touching on because it's probably my favorite is, so if you go to the next slide, um, it's that uh, copper metal is also incredibly good at disinfecting itself. So this is a picture of the Statue of Liberty. I figured I'd throw in the uh, Statue of Liberty found at the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, since this is based out of Paris, it would, I wouldn't be fair to not do that, but we can go to the next slide. We just focus on the uh, well-known uh, American Statue of Liberty, although they're all made of copper. Yes, so I kind of like to joke around and say that the Statue of Liberty is like the only person who won't be catching coronavirus. Um, and this is because copper has incredible self-disinfecting uh, properties. It's a, a fair number of metals actually do, but copper is probably one of the best. Um, so I, yeah, I pretty much, I did some research. Uh, a lot of my research, actually I have it right here, a lot of my research comes from a really well-written article from Vice by Shayla Love. It's called Copper Destroys Viruses and Bacteria. Why isn't it everywhere? So um, 
Yeah, if you have a copper, copper has... door handle, it's not going yes. It, yeah, so even if someone exactly. with coronavirus touches it, it's going to go away by itself. I mean, don't lick it right away, but over the course of an hour, yes, any microbes on that surface should slowly degrade over time. And it's pretty much the way it happens is copper ions um, essentially just destroy the structure of whatever microbe it is. And it, it's viruses, bacteria, um, sometimes funguses. It's, yeah, it, it just things do not survive. So it, there are a lot of different studies that have been looking into this and there's also a push from some medical professionals to coat more surfaces in, with copper in like common areas, for example, so that, right, we're not transmitting um, through touch. Ele elevator so buttons in hospitals. Yeah, exactly. Elevator buttons, call buttons in hospitals. Um, it could uh, really reduce our risk of transmitting diseases. So I'm I think it's pretty cool. Copper clothes. I think yeah. that's new. I'm definitely, I'm like, I am for sure want copper doorknobs when like <laughs> in my future home. <laughs> So and wrap up, does stainless steel have any kind of properties like that? I guess so. Not. Stainless steel is not, not that I know of. Stainless steel, it's easier to clean, for example, which is kind of why people like it. Copper, you know, will start to turn green. Still effective though, even when it's green. But yeah, no, it's copper. And finally, just wrapping back around to uh, Isaac Newton and what he, this student did at home during quarantine, you also uncovered a really cool project that yes. all these kids at home, if you have a game card in your computer, you can help yep. solve the coronavirus issue. Can you tell us about that? Yes, of course. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so this is, yes, this is Professor Greg Bowman. He is the director of Folding at Home, and I got to speak with him on the phone. It was awesome. So if you have a computer that has a graphics card or a CPU, you can download Folding at Home and basically join scientists as they try to find a solution to coronavirus, which is pretty cool. I've got it. Uh, we have it at my, uh, my husband's computer at home has it. Um, and it's really neat. So if we go to the next slide, I can kind of quickly go into how it works. So there are, it's, it gets a little deep. So inside virus, pretty much the way all thing, living things work, although I know viruses, whether they're alive or dead is up for debate, um, they are powered by proteins. So proteins, right, that makes up our muscle, proteins make our hair, proteins um, make and power almost everything. And viruses rely on them too. Now, uh, the way that proteins move and interact though, Greg Bowman, he likes to compare it to a football game. So, and Ted, uh, major props to Ted, he helped me uh, flesh out this uh, metaphor. So thank you so much. Um, but pretty much if you think about, if you say you have a protein like in the virus and you wanna stop that virus and you wanna stop that protein. So let's pretend they're like the opposing football team. The best way to come up with some kind of defense, right? Is to know what they're going to do, you to know what their plays are, what kind of offense they're gonna have, what kind of defense. If you know what they're going to do, you can plan a strategy to effectively you know, stop them and, you know, pretty much win and in our case, defeat the virus. So what Greg is trying to do, sorry, Professor Bowman, <laughs> very casual over here. <laughs> so what Folding at Home wants to do is they want to basically try and uncover what the virus's strategy is. And so they can do that by making these predictions and using computers to make the predictions for us because those kinds of computations, they can take a really long time um, I mean, we can't do it ourselves. We need computers. But even just one computer, if you, this, I think, oh gosh, I should have pulled up the math. I think, did we say it would take like a, like 3 billion years? I think we said it would take 3 billion years for them to go through every possible iteration and every possible strategy in order to figure out what the virus might be doing. And that, <clears throat> that's just way too long. So what Folding at Home does is it takes these problems and it divvies them up amongst volunteer computers all over the world. They, I think, have so many computers now, they've officially become the largest supercomputer in the world. Um, so if you would like to join up, they're still, you know, they still need more computers, they need more people. Um, your computer can, you know, pretty much while you sleep, you just run it and it will run all these protein simulations to try and figure out a cure to uh, coronavirus. And if we and go when to the you wake up, you, does your computer look yeah. any different? Do you, do you uh, know? No, it will like give you a message yeah. of you performed these different things. Yay! <laughs> but that's it. Um, and if we go to the last slide, just really quick, to kind of I with my stories and especially I like to look at what current research is happening and you know 
give a message of hope. So this has seen past successes, which is awesome. So Folding at Home was able to uh, uncover, they call it a hidden, uh, what was it, a cryptic binding pocket. Yeah. So pretty much what it was is uh, for Ebola virus. So Ebola was considered untreatable, but by running all these simulations and looking at the proteins in the virus from every possible angle under every possible condition, they found a site where they could design a drug to treat Ebola and testing in the lab showed that it worked. So this, you know, the process, the method, it works. And um, I think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful and it's a very cool project that you can join from the comfort of your home. Excellent, excellent. Now, Pamela, were you gonna take some questions? Cause I just, there's a question from a second grader that we just, it's so brilliant and yes, okay. Uh, if, if I may share it. And uh, all the other things are really good too, but, but yeah, second, please uh, ask all your questions on chat. You can ask to any of the panelists uh, directly, or you can just ask open questions and whoever wants to take it will take it. So this particular one from a second grader, if you rub pennies on your hands, can this disinfect your hands? Oh, yes, I was supposed to give a disclaimer about that. So, <laughs> As I wrote in my script, copper shines best as a self-disinfecting surface. So you could rub pennies on your hands, but you'd have to cover every inch of your hand and you'd have to kind of, it would have to be constant interaction. Um, so it's not the most effective to stick to soap and water or your alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizers for that. However, if you work with copper, then you might be okay. And that's actually kind of how um, Europe first became wise to the ways of copper. Um, Egypt and Babylonian times, they had already figured it out. But yes, that's, that's another story that I could go into, but more questions. <laughs> so Pamela, do you want to go through these questions or do you want me to? They're really great. Um, yeah, why don't you pick out any questions that you want? I have a question in the meantime, which is just a really basic one. Is just rubbing a, a dollop of hand sanitizer on your hands just as productive as two happy birthdays of washing with soap? So the hand san <laughs> so for hand sanitizers, it has to be alcohol based, and it has to have at least sixty percent alcohol. Um, so just check the bottle. Uh, in the case of coronavirus, yes, make sure you give a full pump. Cover all of every surface of your hand, you know, practice all those good hand washing techniques and moves that you see that I used to make fun of. And now I'm really glad I read those posters. Um, <laughs> so in this case, yes, because the coronavirus structure is such that alcohol based san hand sanitizers work just as well as soap. Not always the case for all things that can infect us, which is why soap is considered best practice, then sanitizers and then copper surfaces just to prevent transmission. Fantastic. Um, I, I'd like I, to add something to that, course. if possible. Um, there's a difference between clean and disinfected, and they're not really the same Ooh, thing, yes. right? So disinfected means any living microbe on there, like whether it be bacteria, the coronavirus, parasites, whatever, uh, those things are dead. That's what disinfected means. Clean means there's no gunk or grime uh, like on, on your hands or whatever the case is. Um, and the issue there is that your hands could be disinfected because you just don't get into like a vat of copper or something like that. Uh, but it may not necessarily be clean. There might be other stuff there that could make you sick in other ways, not necessarily through a disease. This so, is true. Uh, the washing yeah. your hands is still the best way. Yeah, to wash it's not a your thing. hands. <laughs> <laughs> kids say that. So just from the Zoom group chat, I, I just say oink, three kids in St. Louis, um, that's just the great thing for, for a Zoom persona. And other uh, ideas people have is, you know, weird copper keychains that press buttons and open doors for you. That might be a good idea. Um, copper threads in masks, interesting. Could you weave copper in clothes? Um, gloves, and, someone wants to make copper gloves. I'm going long on copper, personally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I will say that with, with all of the copper solutions, as wonderful as they are, Kellen pointed out, they make wonderful surfaces. And part of the reason that is, is because they, they have time to essentially self-disinfect. But if you weave them into things or you're using them in an immediate fashion where you say use it to touch a doorknob, uh, like with these copper keychain things, if you immediately touch that copper, it may not have had time. 
And I'm not sure, Kellen, maybe you know exactly how long it takes. So, researching this. Yeah, a lot of past studies just on different um, viruses and bacteria from the past, it takes, I've seen about an hour seems to be average for like really significant, you know, like 97% has been, um, has been disinfected. So again, yeah, if for immediate it's not the best, but again, they have done studies where they coated um, commonly touched surfaces in hospitals, and that did seem to reduce uh, the, uh, what they had a specific term for it, but pretty much diseases transmitted because you're in a hospital setting. Those types of diseases saw a decrease. So yeah, it's, I think, I think copper is really cool too. I'm all aboard the copper train, but at the end of the day, I'm going to pretty much say this every single time. Washing hands is the best practice and we should all be washing our hands. Oh, okay. And then we have Pia Rigby. Really, there's some virus questions. Pia Rigby, really, and there are two of them. Pia Rigby really wants to know, is a virus a protein? And the second question is from third and fifth graders, very smart, and they fixed on this interesting thing that went quickly, are viruses alive or not? Any of you? That's a can of worms, that last yeah, one. Yeah, it is. A can of worms. <laughs> it's, it's up for debate because I think the debate or it, what it comes down to is because viruses cannot reproduce on their own, which is why they infect us and infect cells in the first place. Um, I don't know, does anybody else have anything more? That's, to... that's, that's exactly right. There's uh, several criteria for life. One of them is like locomotion. It has to be able to move in some way. And even plants can do this to some extent. So that qualifies. There's four others that I won't go into. But one of them is they have to be able to reproduce independently without a host. And so viruses are the most alive thing that does just gets cut off right at the finish line that they cannot actually reproduce. So if all life were to be eradicated from earth and just viruses were here, there's nothing that they could do to live on. And that's why they're not considered living. That being said, you'll hear most scientists still refer to them as, or say, use terminology like we killed the virus or the virus is still alive because it's so useful and they're so close to life. And many people right. say they should probably just be included because they still carry uh, DNA or RNA, which is really the genetic building blocks of life regardless. And um, going back to the protein question, yeah, yeah, they have their own proteins to help carry out those functions. So if you think about us, we have so many types of proteins. They are all over our body in like, I mean, right, they make up everything. Viruses also rely on those proteins, but they have like a handful of proteins, just a fraction. So you might hear about this. I have not I have learned so much about proteins in the past week. I've never thought about proteins as much as I have of late. Um, but pretty much, yeah, they use the proteins. That's how they can attach to cells. They use proteins to produce the genetic code. They use proteins to, yeah, they, they rely on it as well. So if you were to stop a protein from functioning within that system, you would stop the virus from being able to infect cells. Okay. We have a, but they are not one in the same. Question mm -hmm. coming from Eric. Can uh, pets, like can animals like dogs or cats get the virus? So I'm actually very excited that someone asked that because one of the pieces that I wrote, so we'll, uh, we can send out the link I'm assuming at some point too. Uh, so you can listen to this, but there was a wonderful study um, that just came out a couple weeks ago in um, China where they were looking to see what types of animals can pass this on. After all, the virus probably came from bats. So we know that there's transmissibility between different species. So people were starting to get worried about their pets and rightfully so. And not only that, but could my pet get it and take it to the neighbor's pet that takes it to the neighbor? Um, the good news is probably not. It looks like cats actually can get the virus. And in one case, a lion at the New York Zoo actually did get the virus, which is, sounds terrifying. But the good news is that they're mostly asymptomatic. So even if your house cat gets sick, they're, they're probably going to be fine. And as far as we know, they can't transmit it back to humans. Furthermore, they actually tested the virus in dogs, beagles specifically, and none of them got sick. They were completely fine, uh, as were most other animals. They won't get coronavirus. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, we have a second grader in New York asking, how can you have coronavirus but not have symptoms? That is a great question. So, <laughs> yeah, I was reading up on that a little bit. So, um, so the issue is that 
the coronavirus could take up to two weeks for you to show symptoms. symptoms. So it's floating around in your body or to find, but it's for it to finally make its way into your cells and start replicating and do a lot of damage that could take anywhere between five to 14 days. Um, but that's what we mean by asymptomatic. You have it floating around and you're still infectious, but you're not sick. You're not feeling sick. But it seems that from a lot of the studies that are done so far from the doctors that are in the field treating people right now, uh, it seems that if you catch the virus, you are going to get those symptoms eventually. It just might take a while. So when they mean, uh, when you hear like, oh, this guy got sick, didn't have symptoms. Eh, it doesn't have symptoms yet is what we should be saying. At least that's as far as we, again, this is based right. on the information that we have right now, which is changing daily. Uh, yeah. That seems to be the case. Still those mysteries of why more men suffer with it than women do hormonally, why children tend to mostly not get it and older people do. And, and um, yeah, there are really some mysteries still floating around. So the thing about dudes, I was reading about this, it's because we don't wash our hands. We wash our hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's gross. So, it is. It is. Since we're on the topic of um, uh, men and women, uh, before we end it, I just, because we have these brilliant young scientists on the call and two women among them, I was hoping that um, you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, why you went into science and if, uh, if there are some, probably some, uh, clearly some budding scientists asking questions on this call, what advice you would give to young scientists today, just really quickly. Kelly, you oh, want to go first? Uh, <laughs> I can go if you want. Okay, if you're, if you're ready, I'm like, why did I go into science? <laughs> <laughs> to do um, these. <laughs> it's funny, really, when I first started college, I was a communications major trying to get into advertising. And I realized that I was choosing all of my classes to be math and science related. Um, and eventually my mom, who's actually on the call today, was like, you know what, maybe you should just switch to science since every class you're choosing is not communication or advertising related. So I ended up switching to chemistry and I got my degree in that, but it wasn't really until college that I had figured it out. So it's amazing that there's young scientists on the call today that are so interested already. Um, I would say, go for it. If that's what you wanna do, go for it. And if you're not sure, it's okay to change your mind. That's totally fine. I feel like life is about changing your mind all the time and that's okay. Is there an area of science that based on the pandemic you'd recommend they study, like say vi virology? Somebody's asking that. Um, I would say viro virology is very important, but I feel like there's many different there's many different paths you could take. I think even like what Kellen was talking about with the metals or the soap, that would could be more chemistry or material science. There's also biologists. I feel like this has been such an amazing time for collaboration worldwide and it involves so many dis disciplines, um, even anthropology, social science, uh, many different options. Yeah, so my journey was a bit more straightforward. I don't know how or why, but I kind of stuck on science from a young age. I liked reading about, it started with a love of animals, reading about different things, and then had a really great teacher um, in high school. And that pretty much set me on my path. But I think what I have learned from all the people I've met is that it doesn't matter at what point you start. So I've had friends who are you know, much better scientists than I am who started a, like way later in you know deciding that they wanted to be on this path so it doesn't matter when and it doesn't matter you know like don't let different things discourage you i have a slew of horrible grades that i just kind of shoved to the back of my head because you know it's what you know what matters is that you keep putting time and work into it and that you gain the experience that you want and that yeah if you love it then you'll be able to achieve your scientific dreams it, then, and yeah, and science can just go in so many different directions. I did not expect to be in paint, but here I am. It's very interesting. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and then in terms of the virus, yeah, exactly like Brenna said, there's just every area of science I feel like can find some kind of connection to this. It's quite fascinating. Great. Well, um, we're gonna have to end. Uh, Sandra, I wanna give you, before I sign off, I wanna give you a chance if there's anything you wanna, you wanna say. Well, and, and I think, well, and, and part of what we're living so virtually will probably be computer design, computer use design, and the way that Zoom has exploded, for instance, here has been really quite fascinating. And the way that we can do a chat and do on multi-levels is, 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 
I think is going to be more crucial for the future. And um, and so I, of course, want to thank our great science communicators, but also pandemonium you, this would never have happened in any other time. So there are things that are happening. And I think this virtual online community that you have and that or and that education is fantastic and it's free and available to all is is really inspiring and something that we're all working towards regardless. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Our uh, panel, our hive panel of young scientists from UC Irvine, uh, Sanrit Singlo, who's the hostess of uh, The Lowdown on Science, which you'll hear on NPR. Um, and she's the author of a new book that's coming out soon, The Mad Woman and the Roomba, My Year of Domestic Mayhem. She's a smart and hilarious writer. Um, so I'm sure it's gonna be another brilliant book. Um, thank you again to all of you all over the world for being with us here today.